Let's, uh, I guess we got to share my screen here. That'd be a good way, way to start. Yeah, it's nice to get. Yep. All right, Steve. All right, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be with the Houston Geological Society again. It's been uh, probably a couple of years since I, I gave a talk, and uh, I'm honored to be asked again. My topic, as Steve mentioned, is uh, is the long emergency. Um, that was a, a phrase that was invented by a fellow named Jim Kunstler, um, and I'm using it because I think it accurately describes the situation that we're in right now. So uh, the, the subtitle of that is uh, Oil and Gas Prices, Inflation, and Supply Chains, uh, The Long Emergency. So um, <clears throat> what Jim uh, said about this, this is many years ago, is, is up at the top. And, and basically his point is that we're going to see all kinds of oscillations and disruptions in the period ahead. I think he probably said this in, I don't know, 2005, 2006. Um, and, and he was calling all of those disruptions in prices and supplies the long emergency. Uh, the part that I want to focus on here is that no combination of alternative energies will permit us to continue living the way we do or even close to it. So with that, um, a couple of observations that if you read my abstract, you already know about, but for those who didn't or can't remember like Steve and I, because we're too old, um, the mainstream explanation for high energy prices, which is you know, that we're rebounding from the pandemic and you know, demand is strong and uh, you know, and that, and because of underinvestment, et cetera, et cetera, we're having all sorts of shortages and and supply chain interruptions. I mean, it's true, okay, but it's a very inadequate uh, way to describe what's really going on because what's really going on is a system collapse. Um, and I'll just leave it there and and fill in some of the gaps as we go along. Now, there are a lot of uh, very well-intentioned people um, who have started all kinds of what I call energy-blind initiatives to reduce global emissions. And these have been, uh, again, you know, well-intentioned, but those are a big reason for the oil and gas supply demand imbalances that we're seeing. Tight oil and shale gas have been the, the primary components and driver for global energy supply growth over the last 20 years, and that's not happening right now. Uh, there's a variety of reasons that I'll go into, but basically those companies have lost the trust of investors. So after a decade of proclaiming fabulous profits, investors finally realized that they'd been played and uh, they hold their money out. So the tight oil companies, uh, the oil companies in general, they're making lots of money today, but they don't have other people's money to play with. And that's what drove the whole supply increase that really began for oil in about 2010 and for gas uh, probably around 2004, 2005. Now, all of these grand schemes that the world has for lowering global emissions. And by the way, I think that's awesome and we need to do it. I'll get into uh, why I think so later on. But they all call for a substantial reduction in the use of oil for energy. And there's basically just no possible way that that can happen, certainly in the, you know, the 20 or 30 years that these plans envision. So um, net zero is a gross delusion. It's not a gross delusion that it should happen. It's a gross delusion that there's any possibility that it will, at least by 2050 or, or thereabouts. So what we're seeing today is the energy transition. Welcome to it. Isn't it great? We got uh, natural gas supply shortages. We got oil shortages. We got coal shortages. Um, we got prices going through the ceiling. We can't get the stuff that we want to order online. We got ships backed up outside of every major port in the world. 
welcome to the energy transition. Now, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, um, but the point is, is that for those who think that we're going to go into some energy transition and we're not going to have to change our lifestyles or the way that we, we live, welcome to the energy transition. You don't get something for nothing. And I think that's a big problem that people have been basically lied to into thinking that the only thing that's going to be different is we're going to be driving Teslas and, you know, instead of Toyotas or, or, or whatever. And, and that just could not be farther from the truth. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a number of these slides. Uh, you'll have, I think this is being recorded. Uh, you'll be able to get the slides that you can you can study it to your heart's content, but I, I'm just going to go through some of them because they they don't need to be gone through. This is this this shows um, UK natural gas prices, and uh, the average at the end of 2020 was six dollars and fifty cents per million BTUs. Uh, the average since September 21 has been twenty nine dollars and forty eight cents. It got as high as almost $61 when uh, Russia invaded, invaded Ukraine a couple of days ago or last week, it got up to 43 and now it's down back to its average since September of 21, which is 30 bucks. So I'm showing down below in blue, that's, that's the U.S. natural gas price. So, uh, we, you know, we're doing pretty damn well compared to what's happening elsewhere. And by the way, this situation in the UK, it applies all across Europe. It's, you know, knock five bucks off it and you're talking about uh, East Asia. So this is this is a global problem. Uh, coal, uh, same kind of deal. You know, we, we take a look at this and, you know, back at the end of uh, 2020, um, the average price was about $70 per, uh, per metric ton uh, as of, uh, since September of 2021, it's averaged $167, got as high as uh, 231. Uh, the last price I checked uh, last week was 193.25. So, um, you know, big time increases in natural gas and coal. Um, and and I want to talk just a minute about about coal and China, and because China is the world's largest. Uh, producer and consumer of coal, and for reasons that I won't try to explain, partly because I, I just don't understand them fully, um, China got most of its coal from Australia, and they got uh, they got angry for some reason with the Australian coal companies. This was back in uh, 2020, and eventually just started boycotting and saying we don't want your coal anymore. And I guess they thought they could replace it from places like Indonesia and Brazil. And then we had all sorts of uh, weather related problems and COVID related problems. And in fact, they couldn't replace it. And the result is, is that um, prices went up, use went up, and then China decided that we're gonna cut pollution on top of everything else. And so uh, they ended up with really pretty high uh, energy prices, of course, what happened in Europe, you know, the, the green capitals of the world when natural gas got expensive, they started using more coal, uh, the dirtiest fuel possible. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's a mess. And of course, uh, all of this contributes to lower GDP because if things cost more and, and there are shortages, so you can't run all the factories all the time. It affects economic activity. So uh, that is the uh, the proverbial fly in the ointment for the fact that this recovery, this economic rebound from COVID is just going to keep on going and going. But I'll, I'll talk some more about that later on. Um, before we leave China, I just want to mention um, what's happening in China's real estate. There's a a company called Evergrande, which is by far the largest uh, uh, developer in, in China. These are the guys that have built the cities that no one lives in, that have been funded by uh, government capital and liquidity. Uh, there's a, a lot of information here, but 
Uh, Evergrande's projects under construction right now are roughly equivalent to 513 Empire State Buildings, and they're broke. Okay, and uh, they're defaulting. Uh, their their debt is currently being bought by uh, uh, the shadow economy, which is to say, you know, quasi government uh, organizations. Bottom line is this is a hugely deflationary or potentially deflationary event because the government isn't going to save them. And so this is one of those things that's sort of working in the background that as we listen to all the, you know, the celebration of how great the economy is doing and, and how, you know, every oil is recovering, this is going on in the background. So, you know, you can study these charts too, but as a percent of GDP, uh, all this kind of meaningless real estate is 10% of China's GDP. Uh, real estate is 4% of the United States. So uh, this is this is something that maybe you've heard about, maybe you haven't, but you ought to pay attention to. Supply chain. So this is uh, the Port of Los Angeles. And as many of you know, um, a couple of months ago, uh, nothing could get in or out. These are container ships that are you know carrying goods mostly from china and asia and we haven't heard much about it recently and i guess part of that's because it's it, it's not as bad but it's still pretty damn bad as of last week um there were only sixty four thousand empty container ships sitting on the docks in la as opposed to ninety thousand a few months ago and there were only 69 ships waiting to get into port as opposed to 109. But this is what happens when there aren't enough dock workers and truck drivers to pick the stuff up and their ships aren't returning fast enough to where uh, the goods are manufactured and where the goods are being manufactured. Like in China, there are slowdowns because there isn't enough power or the government is trying to uh, clean up the environment or whatever. And this kind of thing just cascades through the economy. And therefore, if you, you know, if you order something uh, online and it isn't arriving, uh, it's probably out here on some ship waiting to get into the port of LA. Uh, speaking of shipping, uh, this is the uh, Freytos sh uh, shipping freight index from about mid 2020 to the present. And what we can see there is that the, the index has gone from about 2,500. It went up at one point to 11,000 in September of 2021. It's fallen to just under 10,000 right now. So, so, you know, cost of everything's gone up. Cost of shipping has gone way up. So, you know, it all, I mean, you, you look at all this information and, and if, if you, you know, if you weren't listening to the news, you'd say, oh, my God, the economy's hosed. <laughs> uh, but you listen to the news and it's great. And then there's Ukraine on top of everything else. So uh, most of you know that Europe gets about 40 percent of its natural gas and 25 percent of its oil from China. Now, the main function or the main notoriety of Ukraine was that Back in the 1990s and early 2000s, almost all of the gas, the natural gas from Russia, came through Ukraine. Now, that's changed. Um, Russia has built the, the Yamal, the Blue Stream, the Nord Stream 1, the Nord Stream 2, which is finished but not flowing gas, and the Turk Stream pipeline. So Ukraine is not as important as a, for, for natural gas transit, but it's still it's still important. Um, the more important thing for me that a lot of people don't know is that Ukraine and Russia are the breadbaskets of the world. Those two countries account for 25% of the world's grain supply. And the fact that there's a war going on between the two says, guess what? If, if, if you think food is expensive right now, uh, there's a lot of parts of the world that simply won't have bread. Uh, the last time there wasn't enough bread or it was too expensive in North Africa, we had the Arab Spring. That was back in, in 2011. Um, energy and food disruptions that are, I mean, it seems inevitable um, that these will happen. Neither has happened yet from the Russian conflict with Ukraine. 
these are going to undermine the global economic activity and they're going to add to inflationary pressures. Uh, no brainer, right? As of a couple of days ago, BP announced that they're exiting their 20% stake in Rosneft. That's 30% of BP's oil and gas production. Uh, you know, that, that's a huge number for a huge company. Uh, they're doing that in protest of what uh, Vladimir Putin is doing right now. Uh, on Sunday, Norway announced that it's freezing Russian assets in its $1 trillion sovereign wealth fund, and it's kicking Russia out. Um, so, you know, we hear a lot of talk about, oh, you know, the sanctions on Russia won't include the energy sector. Well, maybe not directly, but indirectly they will. Will it make a difference? Good question. Uh, the oil and gas sector accounts for half of Russia's export of goods, but only about 15 or 20 percent of GDP. So, you know, will, I mean, does Putin care? No, he doesn't care. Uh, but long term, uh, if this goes on, and it does look like it'll go on for a while, um, could be significant. Uh, as of just today, I heard that the Central Bank of Russia has hiked its interest rates to 20 percent and introduced capital controls. So, Again, that, that will be very bad for uh, Russian consumers and the Russian economy. So we've worked through all of that and we're finally to something that most of us know a little bit more about or feel more comfortable with, and that's oil prices. So this, this chart shows Brent, um, Brent futures from 2020 to the present. And what it shows is, is something that I think we all know intuitively, which is that Oil prices have gone up a lot. In fact, they've gone up uh, almost $82 since Brent has since April of 2020. That's 422%. Uh, the price has increased $31 or 34% just since early December. Uh, today's closing price was $100.99. That's a, a seven and a half year high, highest price since mid September of 2014. Looking then at world oil supply and demand, uh, this goes back to 2005, and I really don't want to get too involved in this. It also shows Brent Price in brown, so the surpluses are in the blue columns and the deficits are in the red columns. Uh, let's focus on the deficits. And so, as you may remember, the last time there was a, a big oil price rally was in 2018 in the in the four, third and fourth quarters uh wti got up to oh this is brent i guess 75 uh, 22 and we look at the supply demand deficits and for two quarters we had an average of 1.2 million barrels a day of a supply deficit well today or recently in the uh, in the last three quarters of 2021, we had a 1.7 million barrel per day supply deficit. So that's the, the, the largest deficit on a quarterly basis and the largest sustained deficit since the IEA and, the, and OPEC and all those guys, EIA, have been tracking this stuff now. You know, it may have been that high back in uh, 1979 and 80. We, we don't really have good data back to there. But the uh, point is, is that there are some really good reasons that oil prices are where they are over $100 uh, today for bread. And that is because there's a big supply deficit compared to, uh, to production. Zooming in a little bit, this is this is what that looks like um, for 2021 and 2022. Now, going into 2022, uh, all all of this is, is is kind of well, it's a projection. I won't say it's speculative. It's just not data. It's, it's what we think is going to happen. Uh, I'm showing supply in green. I'm showing demand in brown, and I'm showing. Uh, a negative supply demand balance in gold and a positive in blue. And you can see there ain't very much blue on the graph. <laughs> but there's less gold than there was in 2021. So 
here are those three quarters, 1.7, 1.7, 1.8 million barrels a day of deficit. Not so bad for the first three quarters of 2022, but look what happens in the fourth quarter. So basically what this says is that higher prices and OPEC uh, bringing on more oil, uh, U.S. increasing some of its production is going to help. It's not going to make it go away. But once we burn through what we can uh, goose out of the system short term, we're going right back into uh, a big time supply deficit towards the end of the year. Now, again, this is this is a projection. We don't know this is going to happen. But notionally, I don't think there's any doubt that that's the direction we're going. Forget about the absolute numbers. Well, where's the supply going to come from? Again, I'm not going to go into all the details of this chart. You can look at it yourself, but this is where EIA thinks the supply is going to come from. And the answer is that um, most of it is going to come, funny, we should mention it, from Russia. <laughs> In fact, 38% of the incremental, this is an incremental chart, uh, beginning at the, at the beginning of 2022 is going to come from Russia. Well, that's not happening, obviously. 26% is going to come from OPEC, supposedly, uh, Brazil 12, and the US 7. Uh, so that, 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 that's what we got for supply. Now, this shows world supply. This is incremental again. Um, and and what it shows, I think, more than anything else, is that there's, a, there's this black dashed line, which is uh, the 2005 to 2011 world supply plateau. So this is before tight oil has really gotten going. And what was happening here was that because of the long time horizon, uh, from discovery to first oil of some of these mega fields that were discovered in the, the Caspian and deep water Gulf of Mexico and uh, deep water West Africa, et cetera. You know, it's taken seven to 10, 11, 12 years to bring these new discoveries online. By the time they came online, lots of other fields had depleted and gone offline. And so we were just kind of stuck here at, you know, like 73 million barrels of crude oil and condensate a day. And markets freaked out because they, they didn't know where the next supply was going to come from. That's why we had over $90 a barrel oil from 2010 to 2014, because the markets were saying, we're feeling pretty nervous here. Maybe we need to keep raising the price. So you guys will drill and find us some oil. What happened was, is this blue wedge is the United States. And, mo and again, this is incremental. So the U.S. was adding a lot of oil and all of it, for the most part, most of it is to say, was from the Permian, the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, you know, all those, Niobrara, et cetera, all the tight oil plays. So um, that brought us up above that world supply plateau. Market said, oh, whew, that's good. And that's why we had the price collapse in 2014. Um, now, shown here is what happened with COVID. Uh, all of the, the economic closures, the shut-ins of all the wells, production dropped a whole bunch. Uh, you know, it's like, a, it's like a big normal fault here. And, you know, that began in about March or April of 2020. Things have been climbing back up. We're, we're back above that plateau, but we're still uh, 6 million barrels a day below this November 2018 world peak of about 82 million barrels of crude and condensate a day. So uh, we're nowhere near the supply that we had not very long ago, and demand is coming back uh, pretty strongly. So that's, that, that's what the world is concerned about. Now, before I leave this slide, I want you to look at the red. That's the rest of the world, uh, minus everybody else, all the big producers that are on this, this chart. And what you see is the rest of the world incremental growth is effectively zero. In fact, it's, it's never been so low before. So markets are really concerned. Uh, OPEC has diminishing spare capacity as they start adding production back. Uh, the U.S. shale patch isn't 
doing very much. Russia's got a limited growth potential and, and it's in war at the moment. Uh, you know, really, I mean, Iraq, Iran is, is about it for where growth can come from, and that's limited. So let's talk for a minute about U.S. shale patch. Uh, this shows overall tight oil production reached about 7.7 .7 million barrels a day in late 19, uh, back up to almost seven. And it shows the breakdown, red is Permian, green is Bach, and Eagle Fert is gold. Niobrara is light blue, and Anadarko um, is, you know, the, the scoop in the stack are, are, are purple. And what you obviously see there is that everything's flat except for the Permian. So the Permian accounts for about 75% uh, of U.S. shale production. So how are we doing? Um, this is a kind of a confusing but fascinating uh, chart. And what I'm showing here then is the average production change per completed well. The blue is positive, the red is negative, and then overall production, this is an index, not a number, so I have to get everything on this chart, is in brown, and the number of completions is in gold. The bottom line from this chart is that tight oil well performance was 22% lower in 2021 than the 2017 to 2019 average. That means that the average new well, the average completed well, performed worse by almost a quarter than the completed wells that were brought online before COVID. The new wells added about 96 barrels of oil per day on average um, in the second half, and they added 123 back before COVID. So the only reason that production is, is increasing is because the number of completions. I mean, this is a brute force kind of deal. Um, you know, rig count is interesting. Rig count's been going up, but the number of completions is increasing. So, so this chart really makes you wonder what's happened. Um, with this number of completions, we ought to be increasing production more. So one conclusion is, oh, well, you know, we're out of all the good stuff. We're, you know, the, uh, the, the, the best wells are gone. I don't think that's the case. A lot of these wells are ducks, drilled uncompleted wells, which were drilled and uncompleted because they weren't judged to be as good. Um, but, and, and another thing is that it's hard to get frack crews. It's hard to get sand for fracks. And so I think operators are having to do less than optimum fracks, not able to do as many zones, as many perfs, uh, et cetera. So bottom line is this isn't coming back. And of course, you know, the shale companies have, have, have found Jesus or whatever, and you know, now they're into you know, so-called fiscal restraint. So you know, guys like Scott Sheffield, the uh, you know, pioneer CEO, you know, he doesn't want to grow production because investors have told him we don't want to see growth. That's great. All right. So let's get down to what, it, what really happens here. This is a chart that maybe if you don't remember anything else from this talk, uh, you know, dig this one out and think about it. Economists have got about 4,000 reasons for inflation, none of which have anything to do with natural resources and certainly don't have anything to do with energy. This chart shows WTI price in brownish gold and it shows US inflation rate in light blue. Now, you don't have to be an expert at reading spreadsheets to see that the correlation is pretty darn strong. So US inflation as of January was 7.5%. And certainly since 2014, if not earlier, um, inflation and the price of oil and the price of energy in general track awfully darn well, as you might expect they should. Because all life runs off of energy. If the price of energy goes up, the price of doing business goes up because you got to pay more for keeping the lights on and, and doing the manufacturing. And, all the distribution and transportation. So if somebody asked me, 
what's the leading cause of inflation? I say it's real simple. It's oil price. And I think I just showed you that oil price probably isn't going to do much except go up. <laughs> Therefore, people that say inflation is temporary or transient, I guess that's the word that we like or that the Federal Reserve chairman likes. Um, I don't believe it for a second. And then this is comparative inventory, which those of you that have you know, not slept through my talks at the HGS for the last 10 years have heard something about um, as you awoken temporarily from your slumber, perhaps. Comparative inventory is just five-year average uh, uh, storage minus the present. And lo and behold, what this chart shows is that there is an awfully good statistical correlation between WTI price in red and comparative inventory surpluses in blue, deficits in gold. So, for instance, um, you know, here, oil price dropped in 2014 from $100 a barrel down to $40 a barrel. And look what happened to comparative inventory. We got Mount Everest right here. All right. As Mount Everest started, that, that surplus started working off. Guess what? Price started rising, got into a deficit, went higher, got into a surplus again. This is 2018. Price went down. COVID came along, huge surplus. Price went down for a day at least to, to negative $38. Where are we now? We're at a deficit level that is at least equal to, if not greater than, all deficit levels since storage numbers were published. So we're, we're you know, the, the red light is on, guys. Uh, <laughs> we're, we are actually, we're, we're at 108 million barrels of negative comparative inventory, which equals the March 1996 all-time record of 108. What a surprise. And so when I take that data, I take the, the, the exact information on here, except it's Brent, I just take oil price, spot price, and comparative inventory, and I cross-plot it, I come up with this. And so what this is, is these are what are called yield curves, just like a bond yield curve, except instead of interest rates uh, and, and uh, maturity uh, dates, we've got spot price and comparative inventory. So the, you know, the shape is a little bit different, but the concept is the same. So, you know, you tell me what you think oil price is going to be, and I'll tell you how much inventories have to fall. Now, this is Brent, and this is OECD, um, you know, the, the rich countries of the world's inventories that we don't have quite as good a data on, or at least not as not as high frequency as WTI, but but pretty good data. And you know, you, you can look at this and say, geez, Art, you know, that that's some of those points don't fit the curves very well. I've, I've, I've published all kinds of stuff on this. Those are price discovery excursions. Uh, that's what the market does when something fundamental changes. It, it tries to find what the, correct, the right price is. But, um, and I've written all about this. But believe me, it, 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 it always reverts to the yield curve. So here we are. We're up here. Um, this is, uh, I believe, this is the, the, uh, the February number. Um, and so we're, we're at $90 a barrel, monthly average, or it was January, actually. Um, so what this says is price is right. That's exactly where it should be. Uh, the brown, that's EIA's forecast for both global inventories and prices. I don't know if they're right or not, but they look pretty good, too. So when people say, oh, you know, this is this price run up is artificial. It's all based on speculation. Um, you know, there's guys manipulating the market. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's going on. But um, when, when things behave according to curves that have worked for, I'm showing five years, six years, seven years here, I say, well, maybe there are shenanigans. You know, it's, it's like election fraud. <laughs> I'm sure there's election fraud. But uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, that Donald Trump won the election. So, you know, there's there, there's there's funny business going on in global markets, but that doesn't mean that they aren't fundamentally following 
supply and demand, at least as expressed in price and inventory. So let's talk about where the world is going. Um, and, and, and so this is, this is uh, IEA, International Energy Agency's blue sky and gorgeous clouds, net zero by 2050 roadmap. And on the right is um, a, a figure that my friend Nate Hagen's put together, um, which uh, I have renamed a little bit as Islands of Reductionist Expertise in the Sea of Systems Ignorance. And so what, we're, what we got here is we got, you know, he's showing climate change and ecology, economics, finance, et cetera. So we got all sorts of, of renowned experts in all these fields and everybody in their, you know, not quite a postage stamp, but a little microcosm of the world has an answer for things like climate change and, you know, and, and the ecological problems of the earth and energy supply and all of that. And the problem is, is that nobody's thinking about energy or climate or ecosystems as complex systems. And that's why we get it wrong. Um, and, and this is nothing new, by the way. I'm, I'm not uh, making a big point. It's just this is a theme that we have to think about. And, and for any of you who have seen Don't Look Up, <laughs> well, um, that's exactly the problem, that, that we just don't have any, any systems thinkers. So most people, if you read the press, uh, listen to anybody, believe that there's an energy transition that's currently underway from oil to renewable energy, and they will tell you um, incorrectly that a green economy is going to support continued economic growth. And the only reason that they believe that is because they're energy blind, that they don't understand energy and they don't have any sense of system thinking. And again, I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody. This is just, this is just, you know, as, uh, as, as some people, this is just an observable fact. Um, the, the reality is that net zero will mean net negative economic growth. No way around it, and it's all got to do with the physics of energy. A renewable electricity-based economy will result in a much poorer world. And, and I don't say these things because I'm saying we shouldn't go there. I'm saying this is just, this is how it will be, because you cannot get more for less. You can't use a less productive form of energy and get the same amount of output that we currently have. And if you don't have the same amount of output, then you're not going to have the same amount of economic activity and GDP. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's just the way, it, it's the way the physics of it is. So um, my conclusion is there is no cl clear way forward that includes sustaining current levels of energy use and economic growth. That means one, the other, or both have to give. And my guess is that both will. We're going to end up using less energy and we're going to have less energy growth. And that could be a good thing. It's just it's going to be a really, really different thing than most of us have grown up with. So, again, my friend Nate Hagens, um, you know, he, he's, he will tell you that energy is and always will be the currency of life. This isn't just a, a thing that human beings do. Uh, animals understand this a whole lot better than, than probably any of us do because they need to eat. And when a, you know, when, when a, when a leopard or, uh, you know, a, a lion or, or a tiger gets hungry, he knows what he has to do. He has to go kill something or a hyena, as we're seeing here. He has to go kill something so he can get energy. Uh, he eats the meat and gets enough energy that he can sit around and sleep, uh, which is what lions do a lot of the time. And they got a good life. Elephants, not so lucky. They've got a less productive form of energy. They eat leaves, and therefore they eat 23 hours a day. An elephant needs about 500 kilograms of, of vegetation to support its weight. Now, it turns out elephants are, are actually more intelligent than lions and leopards and, and, and everything else, but they've got a, you know, a less, they've got a less productive source of energy. Uh, just a fact, not a, not a value judgment. 
So everything that happens in the natural world requires energy, and human society runs on energy. Now, we have a, a, a bad habit of confusing energy with work. Okay, Energy is converted into work. So I take something like oil or natural gas or coal, and I burn it, let's just say, and, the, and by burning it, I heat something that, that turns a turbine, that creates electricity. That's work. Okay, energy and work are not the same thing. I had somebody on Twitter tell me, well, you know, what you're saying is wrong because uh, I said there is no energy transition, that energy transitions are additive. We never get we never get rid of old forms of energy. We just add new ones to it. And he was saying, well, you know, I mean, we, you don't see very many people uh, getting around these days in horses. And I had to point out to this guy who's a physics professor in Germany that a horse is not a form of energy. It's a it's it's a mode of transportation, and more specifically, it's a form of work. If you want to talk about energy, let's talk about what a horse eats. Okay, that would be the right analogy. So work requires energy, and the way that human society works is that we generally have more energy than we use, and that surplus allows us to do all sorts of things like. You know, fool around on Facebook and Wordle and, you know, basically waste our time because we, we can afford to. It's like a lion, you know, kill an impala, sit around and lounge for a couple of days until you need to eat again. So basically, the way human society developed was we lived in a subsistence society for you know, most of, the, uh, of our 300 or so thousand years of, of Homo sapiens existing. And around 10,000 years ago, we started uh, farming, and that led to a surplus for some people, you know, the Bill Gateses and the Elon Musks at the time. And those who had a surplus had grain in their barn. And some of those guys said, well, you know, I don't really feel like going outside and digging a ditch or doing, you know, manual labor. So how about if I go out and find some poor slob who uh, is hungry and I say, look, you know, dig me a ditch and I'll give you a, a bushel of wheat. And the guy says, OK, that sounds great. So he can feed his family and I get the work done. Well, eventually that got sort of cumbersome, you know, uh, trading wheat for work. And so eventually that was replaced with coins, which were subsequently replaced with currency. And and so what we don't really understand anymore is that money is nothing more than a call on work in the same way that you know some guy in in ancient babylonia or assyria said hey bud you know dig me a ditch and i'll give you a bale of of uh, give you a bushel of wheat um today you know i called some guy to fix my hot tub and he said it's going to cost you 860 bucks and i said okay i guess i gotta pay it it's, it's, just, um, it's, it's just a call on his calories or the calories used to manufacture the blower that he needs to replace or something. So since most of the work in the world is done by oil with some help from natural gas and coal, then energy is the economy. Money's a call on energy and debt is nothing more than a lean on future energy. So that's, that's the reality. Money is, you know, the world, the, the economy doesn't run on money any more than, you know, than my physics professor from Germany thought that horses were energy. They're not. They're work. So we're about to go into this huge energy transition, so we think, and we're going to go to a lower energy density source of, of, of energy, of power, and no species has ever done that. Not bacteria, not lions, not horses, not leopards, not anything, and certainly not humans. Hmm. Does that make anybody a little bit uncomfortable? We're doing something we've never done before, but we're sure it's going to work. Yeah. Okay. So the truth is, here is what we use for energy in the world today. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can study it. 
79% of our energy use is fossil energy. Everybody in this crowd has a certain appreciation for statistics and change. You cannot go from 20%, which is all the non-fossil energy in the world, which includes nuclear and hydro and all sorts of stuff that isn't going to grow, like it or not. You can't go from 20% to 60, 70, 80% in a decade or two. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, so not to mention the fact that what are you going to do with all the internal combustion engine vehicles? You can throw them away. I'm not going to throw mine away. I just donated my 25-year-old Ford Explorer to public television. It uh, still works fine. I didn't throw it away. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of misunderstanding about exactly how this energy transition is going to work. And again, I'm not I'm not saying it shouldn't happen. In fact, I I think it has to happen. It's just we're going to be a lot poorer when it's over. This graph just shows a couple of very important things, and, and those are blue is population. And so going back to 10,000 BC, what we see is that when the world ran mostly on wood and human labor from about 10,000 years ago to about 1700, uh, population was pretty damn small and didn't grow very much, all right? We discovered coal and kaboom. By 1900, we had a population that was three times what it was in 1500 because we had more surplus energy, like the guy in Babylonia with the, with the barn full of grain. He could get stuff done. He could tell guys he could pay guys to dig a ditch because he had a surplus. Um, a very important thing happened in 1910 that a lot of people don't know about, and that is that a couple of German guys figured out how to liquefy air and thereby find an abundant source of free nitrogen, which made commercial fertilizer possible. Okay, so you can't feed a world of growing population without fertilizer. So in the coal age, uh, the population of Earth grew from uh, basically 600 million to 2.4 billion by the end of World War II. Uh, the oil age, so-called, began. Now we discovered oil a lot, a lot earlier, but that was when it really became, you know, the or became the dominant fuel. Uh, population went from 2.37 to 5.24 in 1990. It's now at, in 2020, it was at 7.8. So there's a direct correlation between the productivity of our energy and how many souls the Earth can support. Okay. And, and again, you can study this. There's a lot going on here. So we have this idea, particularly in the United States, that human progress results from human ingenuity and, of course, free markets, our, our religion of capitalism. And I'm a capitalist, so you know I buy into it. But um, the truth is, is that the reason for human progress is that a barrel of oil contains four and a half years of human labor. So if you if you measure the amount of calories or joules in a barrel of oil and you convert it to kilowatt hours which we have done and you discount it because of human productivity gains computers and such and we don't work seven days a week we have holidays and things like that if you just do the raw numbers it's about 11 years of human manual labor in a barrel of oil but you discount it back with you know our our own uh uh lion behavior we like to sit around and you know bet on march madness instead of working and things like that it works out to be four and a half years of manual labor in a barrel of oil so th this strange thing on the left is uh is what nate hagan calls a fire ape. okay this is a this is an oil a fossil energy slave so we we use the fossil energy slave um, to get four and a half years of otherwise human labor. Now, if you, if, if you multiply and add all this up, 
Um, it turns out that that the world uses with with oil, uh, gas, and coal, and you convert that into you know barrels of oil equivalent and all of that. The world uses about a hundred billion barrels of oil equivalents per year, and you multiply that by four point five years of labor in a barrel equivalent of oil, and what you end up with is that the reason for all our progress is we have 500 billion fossil energy slaves working for us. That's, that's it. I mean, that's, so, you know, I'm not discount, I'm not saying ingenuity doesn't matter. And I'm not saying that free markets don't matter. I'm just saying they are kind of a rounding error to zero compared with fossil energy. And so that's what we want to get rid of. And there will be a cost. We won't have 500 billion energy slaves working for us anymore. Now, another concept that's kind of important here is, is this comment down at the bottom. Cost is not equal to price, is not equal to value. So let's take a barrel of oil. Barrel of oil, on average, a year or so ago, was about, it cost about $50 to produce a barrel of oil. That's its cost. Its price is what you can sell it for. Okay, that was about $60 a barrel or $65 a barrel. Its value is the 4.5 years of human labor contained in every barrel. And so if you take the, the median US income of you know, something like $30,000 a year and you do the multiplication, you find out pretty quickly that the value of a barrel of oil is about $125,000. So 50 is not equal to 65, is not equal to 125,000. Cost is not equal to price, is not equal to value. And yet we use those three terms almost interchangeably. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, to make you into better wordsmiths. I'm trying to make a point that when we talk about where we're going in our world, we have to be mindful of these things. So I just got done saying that fossil energy is more productive. What does that mean? Well, with a barrel of oil, I explained it. You know, if you measure how many joules are in a barrel of oil, you know what that is. You know, we, we, we can agree. Uh, coal, we can, we can do that. We can measure how much, how many joules or kilocalories are in a, you know, a short ton or a metric ton or whatever we want of, of thermal coal. We can uh, do the same with wood. We can do the same with natural gas. And so the reason that the world prefers using oil over coal and wood is that, well, we, we, we switch from wood because coal has about one and a half times as much energy per unit, per equivalent unit, as wood does. And oil has almost two times more energy per equivalent unit than coal and two and a half times more energy than wood. So, you know, again, it's, 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 it's simple. It's obvious why we, why we prefer high energy density materials. Now, when we get to things like solar and wind and all of that, it's not so easy because we can't measure a barrel equivalent of sun nor can we measure a barrel equivalent of wind. And so what I have done here, and you can you know, go into the details and the physics of it, I have said, let's look at the power density, okay? Because we're just talking about electricity here for now. And power density is simply how much energy can be converted to electric power from a certain volume, okay? So this is, this is the available energy from a volume. So in other words, what I'm saying is that if I've got an oil well or a gas well, let's just say gas because that's what we use for natural gas. I got a gas well and it takes up a certain amount of space and it generates a certain amount of electricity and I've got a solar panel or I got a wind turbine. I can actually calculate the power density from each one of those. 
And if we think of, of the result of that calculation as workers, as I did for our fossil energy or oil slaves, the it takes about 100, uh, I'm sorry, 1,100 wind workers to equal one natural gas worker. And you can do the equations here, you know, coal is 550 and solar is 6.5. So, you know, it takes, you know, what, 100, 200. Uh, um, so solar requires 200 you know, has is, is 200 less times less productive than, than gas. Uh, solar is about 0.6% of the power density of natural gas and wind is about 0.1%. That doesn't mean that you, that you can't use them. It just means that you need, you need 1,000, 1,100 rather, wind turbines to equal one natural gas well if you want to get the same amount of power. Um, so that's how you compare it. So we're going to run this this world on renewable energy. This this chart shows exactly what the world uses in terms of natural gas, oil, coal, and non-fossil all sources of, of energy. And it also shows population, because that's kind of important. And it shows the renewable fraction. All right. So the problem that we have is that today. The non-fossil, the renewable, the hydro, the nuclear, the, you know, the sludge, biomass, all that stuff. We get enough energy out of that to support a population of about 2 billion people, except we've got 8 billion people. So what's going to happen? Well, we're going to grow. We're going to grow that non-fossil. And let's just say that we grow, we, we, we triple it by 2050. I don't think we're going to do that, but let's just be optimistic and say that. That means that we can support a population of 6 billion people on non-fossil energy by 2050. And the UN thinks we'll have about 9.8 billion people by 2050. So what does that mean? That means that 4 billion people have to die. It's just that simple. The world cannot support 10 billion people on non-fossil energy. And if you want to just talk renewable, well, you know, it's a bloodbath. So, you know, we don't ever hear about this. Uh, you know, we don't hear the uh, the Extinction Rebellion talking about the fact that 4 billion people need to die for their Extinction Rebellion to be successful, because they probably have no idea what I'm talking about. They don't, you know, don't confuse me with facts. I've got my mind made up. We, we, you know, we focus an awful lot on electric vehicles, but ironically, electric vehicles will not reduce emissions very much at all. So this pie diagram that I'm showing is where all the emissions come from. And 16% of them come from transportation. And it turns out that less than half of the internal combustion engines that were manufactured in 2020 were used for cars. The rest were used for agriculture, manufacturing, power generation, forestry, construction, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're all really uh, feeling motivated to go out and get an electric car. But the, the truth is, is that it, it's just, you know, I mean, everything helps, but it, it's, it's not going to change the world. I'm sorry to say, it just, it, it isn't. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, we've got this loss of trust in the oil industry and et cetera. I, I show this because it, it's fascinating. This is this is data you can get if you care to get it. Uh, the Standard & Poor's, um, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the S&P, yeah, the Standard & Poor's 500 has an index of ESG, which is, you know, environmental, social, and governance kind of stocks. And it's got an index of energy stocks. And what it shows is that ESG was taken off like a rocket and energy performance had dropped about 30% since around 2014. Now we're seeing a little bit of an uptick and we're actually seeing a little bit of a downtick in ESG, but this is where the world is. Okay, this is what they want to do. 
they want to invest in things that are ESG, that are, you know, that, that feel good and look green and, and et cetera. And that's why there isn't that much capital available for energy. And this is all energy, including renewable, by the way. Now, before I close, I just want to make the point that there is a lot of misleading information and downright lies about climate change. And I recently, um, somewhat reluctantly, um, decided to read Stephen Coonan's book called Unsettled, which makes the point that climate change is not as big of a deal as we think it is and that we shouldn't worry about it all that much. And, and, and I'm just going to, you know, and we've got other people. I mean, you know, there's Greg Wrightstone and there's, you know, all sorts of people that are feeding us, you know, what we desperately want to hear, which is that we don't have to change our lifestyles. We don't have to change our behavior. We hate that. We really hate to have to change our behavior. And they're telling us what we want to hear. And so we all say, yeah, 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 that's great. So, so, so Dr. Coonan, um, who I'm sure is a, a lovely guy and a very smart guy, I'm confident. He's showing here annual Greenland ice loss from 1900 to 19 to 2021. And he's showing that, you know, there's ups and downs and that basically what's happening right now is just one of those ups and downs. And therefore, you know, it, it's natural. It has nothing to do with climate change. So I went and got the data behind this graph and I reproduced it and I reproduced it absolutely faithfully. Um, I, I was able to do what he did. Now he doesn't want to tell you this is a 10 year average. And you know a 10 year average of annual data is, is a little bit bogus statistically, but fine. So here is Kunin's 10 year average ice loss curve. This is the actual annual data. So there's quite a bit of a variation, and the reason it varies is because there's a lot of a lot of seasonal difference between summer and winter in a place like Greenland. But what he doesn't tell you is using the exact same data. This is cumulative ice loss. The cumulative ice loss in Greenland since 1900 is 15 trillion metric tons. That is a great big number, Dr. Coonan, which you are saying isn't happening or doesn't matter. Okay. He says this is, this upper graph is the carbon dioxide concentration over the past 550 million years. And what he says is, what are you guys worrying about? We are at, we are as low as Earth has ever been. It was only this low in the Permian. There were a lot of extinctions in the Permian, remember? Oh, well, no, no, don't talk about that. So there's nothing to worry about. This is all a bunch of BS, you know, that, that, that a whole bunch of, uh, of opportunistic and, and, and research money hungry uh, climate scientists are fudging the data and they're creating a situation that is absolutely not true. Well. I went and got the data, <laughs> and here is the last 2,000 years of carbon dioxide data. And I plotted it just like he did, compared to 1950. See, CO2 then, CO2 now. He's comparing it to the year 1950. So I did the exact same. And what you see is that CO2 is kind of doing nothing until about 1750 when the industrial revolution and we started using coal and lo and behold it's gone through the ceiling now again i don't want to get into arguing whether co2 is a leading indicator or a trailing indicator you know i mean there's a gazillion arguments here i'm just trying to show that when you read a book and you see these graphs and you want to believe and you're getting your confirmation bias confirmed you say you know what this is all bs this is a hoax, and I don't believe it. And I'm here telling you, this is what the data says. You can do what you want with it. Concluding thoughts. Energy is the economy, and oil is the master energy resource. Climate change is real. 
You can argue with me offline if you want. I've done the research. I think it's real. I, I can't imagine any geologist would think it's not real. What we can argue about is what's the cause, okay? And I think I just showed you two graphs that give you some indication that it's not natural. It, it's all happening in the last couple of hundred years and particularly in the last 100 or 150 years, or 150 to 100 years. I think it's a real problem, but that's me. I don't want to argue about it right now. But energy blind people and their rush into renewables is not a solution. Not if we want to keep living the way we live and having these nice, cushy lifestyles. So few people, very few people, understand what they're signing up for, what this green energy transition is about. What you're signing up for, the physics tell you, is at best zero economic growth and probably negative economic growth. Now, if, if I were to point that out to people, particularly people that are in business and say, well, if I told you that this energy transition is going to be negative economic growth, what would that, how would that affect your, your enthusiasm? Well, no, I don't, I don't want that. I can't do that. I can't live with, with negative economic growth. Well, how about if it meant going back to living standards of the 1960s or 70s? Well, no, I can't deal with that. Well, what if it meant a couple of billion people? Let's just say a billion. I mean, you know, 500 million have to die. Well, that's not right. That's not fair. Oh, well, but that's what's going to happen. As I said before, not only humans, but no life form has ever gone from a higher to a lower productivity energy source, ever. And yet, we're all off on this, this, this trip to Abilene like, well, that's not a problem. Well, maybe it's not, but it's never happened. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you go, you, you, you got a, a, a medical problem and you, and you go into the hospital and they say, well, you know, there, there, is, there is this cure, we think, um, for what's, what's going on with you. And we can do this kind of operation. Now, mind you, it's never been done before. Uh, but but we're, you know, how about if we try it? And I don't know what you're going to say to that, but the point is there's, there's a lot of risk associated with never done before that nobody is talking about. Nobody, not very many people. There is no clear way that I can see of sustaining current levels of energy use and maintaining economic growth. Cost, price, and value are not the same and renewable arguments about how oh gee you know the 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 cost of solar okay it's not the cost it's the price guys the price has gone down true enough but what about the value can you get $125,000 for a barrel equivalent of solar no way the value ain't there so it's not so you know you can it can be free. Solar and wind can be free, and we still cannot have economic growth and support a population of eight, nine, or ten billion people on renewable energy. Again, that's not my preference. That's the physics. That's what it says. What I say is, and this is not new. Substitute natural gas for coal first. And let's, let, let's, let's talk about renewable energy storage. If we could store some of this solar and wind, then, we, then we'd have something to talk about. I think that focusing on the simple growth of solar and wind installations, which is you know, kind of what, what these businesses and, and you know, a lot of the pro-renewable organizations focus on, that's like focusing on tight oil production growth. It's a losing business model that investors will get tired. Thanks as always for your attention and interest. And uh, if there's time, Steve, I'll uh, be glad to take some questions.
So, Art, Scott Secrets here. May I ask a question or make an observation? Uh, you can do whatever you want, Scott. The floor is yours. One of the things that I've realized, and um, I'm embarrassed by the simplicity of the observation, but all of the renewables create nothing but voltage. They don't create molecules. Hydrocarbon is utilized for energy in the form of gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, uh, transportation. However, a substantial percentage, and you probably have your hand on the numbers much better than I do, a hugely substantial portion, maybe half, a, a really big number of the value and the output of hydrocarbons becomes molecules. It turns into um, synthetics. It, uh, it becomes fabric. It becomes food wrap. It becomes um, uh, the, plastic, the stuff that you make cars out of, the stuff that you make everything in your house out of, everything that's not steel or wood, everything that's in a cell phone that's critical other than metal uh, or, or critical metals is plastic. Uh, the whole world is, is going to plastic. We're not making things out of wood anymore, and, and metal is getting way too expensive. So where are all these molecules going to come from if we go to a renewable economy? You can't make molecules out of voltage. End of comment. Uh, and thanks for... Yeah, Scott. So, I mean, you bring up a couple of good points, and, and, and let me just say for for starters that you can look at you know, where are we at right now? Electric power accounts for about 30% or 30% of, of, of total energy consumption in the world. And if you add in or subtract out all the energy losses from generation, transmission, and distribution, it's less than 20%. Okay, so... so Renewable energy and nuclear, by the way, is good for nothing except for electric power generation. And electric power generation only solves 20% of our energy problem. And if you look at any projection, including IEA's roadmap to net zero 2050, we never get above about 42 or 43% electric power subtract so out the you know the power loss and we're still at 20 percent so you know it's, it's bewildering to me how intelligent people seem to not understand that and that's because they're energy blind and, and most people are entitled to be energy blind because energy is not their field but you know I, I mean i hear all kinds of of um of people in our business who are you know geologists or, or, or engineers that seem to not understand and, and again my, my position is, is very clear and very strong I'm all for renewables I'm all for getting to net zero it's just we're never going to get there by 2050 no matter what and we're certainly not going to get there with our standard of living intact any other questions or comments I really did not see many questions, and most of them got answered during your talk. There were a lot of comments, uh, many by Bill, Bill, Bill DeMess and some other people, but I did not really see any other questions. Hmm. Uh, so well, I guess if I anybody holds a question, now is the time to ask it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question. Art, what do you think about carbon capture and storage? I know it's too expensive right now, but... Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's uh, it's sadly a rounding error to zero. Um, and again, I, you know, you look at, and I know you know a lot more about this than I do, Mary. But again, I you know, I just I just look at um, at the projections, you know, and and look at the most optimistic projection that that you can find, which is IEA's roadmap to 2050 net zero. And, and, and they actually break out 
you know, what they call unabated natural gas and unabated coal. And, the, and they, you know, and they show you exactly how much of the net zero um, objective is going to be accomplished by carbon capture and sequestration. And it's, you know, it's essentially a rounding error to zero. Um, and, and so we come back to this, to this issue that everything should be on the table and should be used. And, and there may be some breakthrough that, you know, that we don't know about today. And, and of course, that's, that, that's true of everything. But um, without being an expert on, you know, on, on, uh, on CCS, it doesn't look like it's going to be a huge help in the short term. It may end up being a big help in the long term, but in the, you know, if, if you if, if like me, you, you actually think that, you know, that the climate change does have some urgency to it. And don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not one of those people that's constantly pounding the table about it's an emergency and it's a crisis. Um, it's a problem. Uh, but if, if you feel any urgency at all, it's just very difficult for me to see how something like CCS can be, can be converted into a meaningful volume, even if the technology, even if cost isn't an issue. I mean, that, that, you know, but, but like I say, Mary, you know a lot more about it. I mean, tell me, tell me where I'm wrong or tell me why I'm wrong. I'm, 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 I'm glad to be wrong about all these things. Oh, I can't tell you that you're wrong, but it sounds like you're saying buy that farmland in Man Manitoba. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that uh, what I'm really saying is um, is get used to living with less is what I'm saying, because, I mean, that's where we're going. I don't think there's, you know, there's any amount of... Uh, of enthusiasm or technology in the world that's going to change the basic picture that I've described here in the time that any of us are going to be alive, which doesn't mean give up and go home. It just means, um, you know, figure out ways of, of, of living with less and being happy without quite so much uh, energy consuming things. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I was happy and alive in 1960 and 1970, and I grew up in a house that's a lot smaller than most people's have in my my present house, and I didn't feel like I was disadvantaged. Uh, so, I mean, going back to the economy of 1960 or 1970 it is not a terrible thing. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, no, it's, yeah, I'd, I'd like just like to comment. Yeah, I grew up on a farm pretty darn close to Manitoba, so I don't have any problem with, uh, uh, and, you know, of course, it'll be warmer in Manitoba in 2050. Good place for my grandkids to go. But as far as the carbon sequestration goes, I mean, when you look at like the volume of places to put all, what is it, 900 gigatons? Yeah, there's plenty of room to put all 900 gigatons of excess CO2 that we've produced since uh, 1950. Uh, so there's plenty of room to put it back, but the trouble is it's, it's just like too, um, it, it's way too expensive at this point to put it back. I am, uh, you know, if we're going to subscribe to the belief that technolo technology is going to save us, then yeah, I do see a, a simpler lifestyles in the future, but I just, I think that we possibly could design our way out of this mess. And I do think it would have to include some carbon capture. That's the end of my sermon. No, I, 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 I that land in Manitoba. I, I, I think, as I said, all things should be on the table. Carbon capture is part of it. I just don't realistically see that the volumes make sense in the time that we have available. And I, and I would like to make uh, another, um, uh, another opinion. I, I, I think that 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 our our faith in technology that does not yet exist is is just as irrational as as blind faith is in anything. The idea that technology will save us, I think, is absolutely a, a fallacious concept. 
And the reason I say that is that technology has never created energy. People don't seem to understand that. Oh, well, we got all this horizontal drilling and fracking and blah. You're not creating energy. All you're doing is creating a, a bigger straw. You, I mean, technology is a way of, of accessing more energy faster, cheaper, more efficiently. But they're never, I have never seen a technology, certainly not in oil, gas, coal, or anything else that I've been involved in, that creates one barrel equivalent of new reserves. It's simply a way of converting energy to work. That's all it is. And if we understand that that's what technology is, then we can be happy with it and we can praise it. But it does not produce energy and it does not increase the amount of energy that there is. That's my sermon. <laughs> I think uh, Jared Height had a, Haight had a pro, uh, question for you, Art. Great. He said, Are you always said the shale revol revolution was a retirement party. Do you see a second retirement party from shale or something else? Example, given Venezuela revitalization to stave off deep deficits in the years ahead. No, retirement party, you know, when you retire, you retire. I mean, some people go back and, you know, do volunteer work at a hospital or something. But I think what we're seeing is that um, what 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 shale did for us and, you know, thank God for it, it got us 10 more years, you know, back in 2004, five, six, seven, eight, we were, you know, all thinking, not all, but I was thinking about peak oil. Okay. Well, peak oil didn't go away. We just, we just got a reprieve of, of about 10 years because of, of, of tight oil. Okay. And, and, and that's, you know, that has a, a limit to it. It's, we're not, you know, it's not over, but it's it's like anything. I mean, we, we make a big play. You know, the deep water got us, you know, I mean, somebody here knows better than I do, you know, how many tens of billions of barrels of new reserves. We found them. We will continue to find a little bit more, but we're not going to find anywhere near as much as we already found. And that's the way it's going to be with, with shale also. Uh, you always find the you know, the, the greatest amount of it early. And occasionally you get a second win. I mean, U.S. production peaked the first time in 1970. We found Prudhoe Bay, you know, a decade and a half later, and it created another little bump on, on U.S. production, but didn't go back up to the same level. We found shale, and, and, and that brought us higher than we'd ever been, but we're on the decline there too. And, and I think that that's, that's normal. You discover a field, it's great guns, you make a lot of money, and then it, you know, eventually it, it depletes and that's it. And, and and that's the I mean, that's that's physics. That, that's not that has nothing to do with being an optimist or a pessimist or anything. That's just physics. It's it's simple physics. And you can get into thermodynamics if anybody cares to, and I'll 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 yield the floor to somebody who understands those complex equations better than I do, but but I understand the essence of it. This is the universe that we live in, and I think it's you know it, it's it's time for those of us who have the backgrounds in the science to, to to interject a little bit of reality on things. I mean, the universe isn't everything you hope it will be. It is what it is, and it doesn't give a hoot about your hopes and dreams. It's physics, and and it's geology, and it's geophysics, and it's engineering, and it's economics, and and you know, I, I, I there, there's nothing pessimistic about that. It's it's called learning to live within your means, and and for those who are, you know, who 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 just desperately need to believe that climate change isn't real, I simply ask, well, you know, is do do you question do you question the pollution of you know of 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 the land, the rivers, and the ocean? And do you have any question that those are due to human activity? I mean, there's no natural cycle that's going on that's causing 
the widespread pollution of the planet. Okay, that's us. All right. What about the extinction of, you know, the massive extinction of, of other species? Well, you know, we can argue about that, but for the most part, I think anybody that's, that's rational and objective will say, yeah, you know, it's either because we're, you know, humans are killing them off or, or we're, you know, we're, we're, we're encroaching on, on, on their habitats. Um, you know, our, 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 is the deforestation of the planet, particularly the rainforest, you know, is, is that a part of a natural cycle? No, of course not. I mean, human beings are cutting down and burning the rainforest. Now, maybe that's all for good reason. But, you know, so, so nobody really disagrees that any of those things are because of human activity. Therefore, why is it so, you know, off the wall to suggest that the same kind of human activity may also be affecting climate change? I, you know, it just, it just seems logical to me, you know, all other arguments aside. But, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, maybe I'm just speaking from bias or something. But I just think that the sooner that we're, you know, that we as a group of scientists are, are able to sift through what's, what's, what's real, what's likely and what's probable or possible, the better we're able to help our, you know, our, our friends and our families who don't know what we do, don't have the background or the training to understand a little bit about what the future is likely to hold. And I don't think it'll be terrible. I do think we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do about 10 billion people. That, that, that's, that, that is hey, the Art, problem. Uh, Bill Demis here. Uh, uh, I have a question. I had my hand, hand raised. Hey, uh, great talk as always. Uh, really, you. You're spot on. Um, I, I I put a pencil to wind and wind and solar and looked at looked at looked at that in detail and and this whole idea of we're going to go to net zero uh, by 2050, I'm looking at it. I, I see it almost as like a tulip bulb mania, mania or there's a social mania going on right now, where it's becoming the systemic dialogue where people really think this is going to happen, and there's just I don't know. What's your thoughts on? What the, the, my other comment is, I absolutely agree with you, the idea that sometime after 2030, according to the, the, the IEA, even they said that we're going to need new technology to get to net zero by 2050. And um, I think it's just pie in the sky. I mean, that's just like a, a magic silver bullet, like uh, when we hear about solar and wind and, well, we'll capture that with the silver bullet is batteries. And it's like, well, that's a bunch of hokum. There's not enough batteries on the planet to store the energy we need. But what I'm really wondering is, do you see this as, I see as a social mania. Have you read some of the books on the madness of crowds or, you know, there's several uh, of these that have gone on, you know, several of these social mania events that have occurred before. That's it's, different. You know, it, yeah, it's, it, it's belief driven, okay? That, that, that people, you know, we, we believe what we want to believe and we find information that supports our belief. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's just the way humans are. And, um, and we're not going to change that, but um, it, it's a form of delusion. And, and it's part of, I think it's just part of what we, what we must do to stay sane because we can't, you know, we, we just can't, we can't fathom a world that doesn't conform to um, to our preferences. I, you know, it, it, it's it's ultimately, in my opinion, it's it's a it's a matter of uh, emotional maturity, <laughs> um, which is not to say that you know that that I have achieved some very high level of emotional maturity. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just I'm just saying that you know to me that's what it's about, and and we uh, and, and and people people want to believe and and because they want to they will find reasons to and and it is delusional but at some point you see i mean what what i think what seems to be the the message of history is that the only thing that really causes humans to change is disaster trauma and and so you know something really awful happens and that seems to 
get our attention at least until we've, we've gotten past that and and maybe that gets us to you know to uh, to modify our behavior and, and so if i'm you know and i hope i'm wrong i really do but uh if if a few billion people need to um to die in order to accommodate whether it's a choice or not a choice of this transition to using less energy, um, their their deaths are, are are horrible. But can you imagine the social unrest, the civil unrest that will result? I mean, we had a couple of million people. I don't know what it's four million or five million. I mean, somebody else maybe knows this better than I do. Four or five million people that emigrated from places like Syria, mostly into Europe and, you know, a little bit into places like the United States and Canada over the last 10 years. And I mean, look at the level of 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 of, of civil unrest and social distortion and and anger and hate and building walls and God knows what else resulted from that. Well, you know, multiply, let's just say it's, it's Let's say it's 20 million people. I think that's way extreme. Let's just say it's 20 million. Well, what if we have a few hundred million or a billion or more people that are displaced by not enough energy to live? Um, Can anybody begin to imagine the kind of, of, of civil unrest that will result from that? I mean, you know, it's just un- it's, it's unimaginable. And so those are the kinds of things that, you know, I don't have any way of, of wrapping my head around it, except in a very general way. But, um, you know, those are the things that, that worry me a lot more than, uh, you know, than, <laughs> than moving up to Manitoba with Mary or Saskatchewan. I can't remember what it was, Mary. You know, that, that, that's relative. Manitoba. Manitoba, thank you. <laughs> I mean, you know, those are those are relatively easy decisions. It's you know, it's it, it's when there's uh, all kinds of people who have nothing that are you know that are you know, desperate for for food and and and, uh, and and to stay alive. I mean, you know, that's that's a much more frightening prospect to me, and I, I just don't see how. Uh, well, I, I just don't know what you do about. Um, Scott, I think Scott, uh, excuse me, our Scott Secrets has his hand up. I don't know if that's a relic. Or... No, it's not a relic, uh, Steve. I definitely wanted to comment there. I think the simple answer to, in a very narrow sense, to what Art is saying about the population, I think the reality is that we are not going to have 10 billion people enjoying the American lifestyle of a 3,000 square foot, two story home with 3.x automobiles at the current level of energy consumption we now have. Um, I've been blessed to travel uh, a couple of times worldwide. I saw India in 2008. Even the poorest person there knew that they were going to have a better day tomorrow and their kids were going to have a better day tomorrow. And their fondest dream was to have wheels, you know, um, you know, a five horsepower Honda or the equivalent or uh, Maharishtu or, or whatever, none of them would ever think of having a, uh, a Honda Civic or a Cadillac or a Mercedes. You know, we can go buy a five-year-old $20,000 car and, you know, in the American economy, that's a great cheap deal. But around the world, nobody has it lavish like that. And that is lavish. It's, it's ordinary for us. But it's all about expectation. And I think art has been circling uh, the wagons on expectation. And that's what it really amounts to. We're never going to have any form of energy, even fusion. You know, 50 years ago, fusion was 50 years away. Uh, We've had big results in fusion recently in the last two or three years. They've made remarkable progress. But if we could say, hey, in 25 years, we're going to have free fusion for the entire world, all fusion, free fusion worldwide, will never do anything but produce voltage. Nothing is going to replace the hydrocarbon molecules that we build the modern world out of 
And just like Art said, show me anything that will replace reserves or hydrocarbons, consumable molecules. I can't see even fusion. I mean, you have to go to something totally science fiction to replace the hydrocarbon molecule. We can't do it with wood. We were shaping wood and we were burning wood. You can do a few funky chemical things with wood to get a tiny fraction of the molecules you need that we now get so freely and easily from hydrocarbons. But just like Art said about energy, you're not getting those hydrocarbon molecules from any other source on the planet. End of rant or end of comment. Art, fantastic, fantastic observations. I just wish every American could see it and hear it and realize the reality of what we're facing. Thanks. Great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Okay, all right. I don't see any other questions, and it's running on to what seven thirty-eight. So I basically we, I suggest we adjourn the the meeting and Sounds everybody good. ponder on what Art said. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you guys know where to find me if you want to talk about this further, and uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm sure not everything that I said and showed. Certainly, it's not. Uh, and everything changes. I, I, I sometimes get criticized for if somebody dredges up something I said in you know, 2004 and they say, see that, you were wrong. <laughs> you know? uh, got more information since 2004. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, uh, I appreciate everybody's questions and comments and uh, I'm always available. You know where to reach me. You can email me or get on my website. By the way, I mean there are at the my my review of uh, of Stephen Coonan's book is on my website. It's free. Um, I've got a, you know, a, a, a post on on why nuclear is is you know it's it, it's part of the solution, but it's just electric power, and and therefore you know it's it, it, it's not going to save anything. Uh, you know, based on that, I've got why the renewable rocket is sold to launch. It's all for ArcRimmon.com. Uh, lots of stuff, comparative inventory. You know, there's nothing there, there's nothing for sale there. So, uh, I mean, there is, but I mean, all those posts are free. And uh, so, if you want to dig into a little bit more of why I think what I do, um, you know, just go there and check it out. It's free. Okay, Art, let's go ahead and shut her down. Uh, All right, Steve. Thank you for inviting good, me. Good. Thank everybody for, uh, you know, for your attention and, and your comments and questions. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for giving the talk, Art. You always give good talks when you give them. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs> good night. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody.